So welcome. Thank you all for uh, joining us in this virtual event. Uh, my name is uh, Robert Weisgraber. I'm Managing Director and CTO at AX Semantics. And today we'll talk a little bit with uh, Ben Rund from Riversend. Uh, you can introduce himself in a few seconds um, because he can do that better now. But um, we at AX Semantics, we do a lot of, lot of content generation. That, that's what basically what, what we are doing. And as part of this, if you look at it kind of like a, a value chain problem, content generation is a, is a small part in a big chain from getting data, having data, getting data, making data nice and pretty, and then publishing and, and the evaluation at some point. And so we have a kind of like a diverse ecosystem of, of partners. Um, and Riversend is one of those uh, that are uh, exceptionally good in the uh, product information management space um, or, or master data management or whatever. We'll see what it is. And this plays a big role, as you'll see, in terms of what you can get out of content. And although that's why uh, we join forces sometimes in bringing some of the topics that we think can actually benefit you uh, together. A um, few, few words, that's the marketing slide for AX, a uh, few words about us. We do something, it's called the technique, it's called uh, natural language generation. Um, and basically what we do is we give customers or users the ability to turn their data into written content in 110 languages. Um, and we are very super familiar with the e-commerce space. We do some publishing as well. Uh, some last year, the Stuttgart Zeitung won the Konrad Adenauer Prize with, with the text about air pollutions that they did. Um, uh, and in, the newest additions to that are, are in the finance and pharma space as well. Uh, but e-commerce is basically a, a bread and butter uh, topic because um, it's something that's actually a hard problem because text quality, especially if you think about product content or something, uh, is a hard problem because the text quality is something that um, is very responsible for, for the success of uh, the e-commerce stores. Um, so text quality is something that we really love and are looking into to give users the ability to influence that and put it into a, the uh, right direction. Because I mean, what we are doing with e-commerce is something like this. We email you in, we're doing or pretending we are a store, a retail store, like these, some people are still visiting this in these hard times, but uh, this is how it looks. So, um, I put it from Flickr. I actually don't know where this, but is this, but it looked nice and colorful. Um, so, but if you think about what, what a retail store is actually doing since decades, if not, uh, if not even longer, um, it's trying to put the customer into the center of attention and, and solving the problem for the customer. Um, if you nowadays talk to e-commerce people, that thinking has already been, is, is there, but 10 years ago or something, people were more like solving problem, technological problems. How I do I make a shopping basket? How do I avoid fraud? How do I do my logistics and stuff like that? But in, over the last few years, this has shifted to actually bringing a customer experience in focus um, that focuses on the customer and not on just making it possible to buy online and getting it solved. Um, so what, what's happening is that we try to put the customer in focus. The buzzword I think is customer centricity uh, and really give the customer a, a benefit there. One of those trends that is coming or that is already there for um, customer centricity is personalization. Um, the reason for that is, is it has been proven, Garden et al has, has done that, that, that if you do personal messaging, um, you get a lot more commercial outcome uh, compared to others who don't, who are not doing that. Um, and also tools like us and uh, uh, like ours and others um, have proven that you can use some AI tools to do that with content as well, to reach readers, to resonate with your, uh, with your readers. Because if you think about it, if you go to a retail store, the, the clerk or the, the salesperson there, they wouldn't just tell anything or, or tell everybody the same story. They would try to give you, to, to make something that resonates with you, look you in the, into your eyes and see if it were the messaging that I have work or maybe to tell you a different story. So personalization is a big thing. Um, one of the five or four mega trends, I think in e-commerce at the moment. But most, most uh, companies actually struggle with that, um, that their personalization strategy is actually isn't working because what, what's happening, people are always looking at, the green grass on the other side of the fence. They're looking at 
the big data projects or uh, integrating all that CRM data into kind of like using cool machine learning tools, putting them together. But what they're not looking at is doing the homework, doing the housekeeping, uh, because that actually is something that they could leverage um, uh, and get started already with some results. So Bain and Company did that. I think that's a study from actually May 2020 or something. So it's, it's uh, uh, not only very recent, but also in terms of COVID, uh, very interesting that uh, they're already, they're still looking at it, stuff like that. Um, and give the recommendations to you companies, uh, e-commerce or retail that is e moving to e-commerce. So take control of what you're doing with the data um, and actually look at the first party data that you have invest in that data uh, and, and try to exhaust what you can do with that before looking at the other side of the fence uh, and do the, all the, the big stuff that is in there. You, and then look at the next step, of course, looking at that, integrate that third party data into what you do. Um, so we like to have, it's kind of like a, a flow uh, of buzzwords going here. Um, you have this algorithmic retail that encom encompasses everything that you're doing in retail to try to do solve it with computers and, and machine learning AI or basic uh, things like, like normal computer software. Uh, then there's this in algorithmic commerce that actually focuses more on the selling stuff. But in the end, uh, if you want to emulate a conversation with a product expert, which is what you would do, what you would like to see as a customer in a retail store, um, we need to look at how to achieve customer centricity. Uh, in terms of stuff that you can do or should do or might do, um, there's a good overview here that shows the, the three basic parts uh, in, in terms of how to reach the, the, the user. Um, I mean, you have this, UX UI problem that's here at the bottom that, that for example is just a normal buying process. Yeah, how do I set up an account? What's my checkout does look like? Uh, where's my order history? That's something that that product management people or product owners can can solve very well. Um, you should do A/B testing, all that stuff, but it's classic UX UI stuff. Um, then you have the ones that look at how the customer is moving between purchases, in purchases. Uh, does he move from offline to offline uh, to online? Um, they, they are using here this, this kind of a, a, a word of mobigrams. Um, so when can I give him tailored information, a set of products, think like the, the, the famous newsletter that you get after your water washing machine that gives you access to more washing machines, probably a bad example, but it's a very common one. Uh, and what is actually trending at the moment, that's also interesting. And then you have this big part in the middle um, where, where customers actually, and visitors of your online site are discovering your products. Um, and then go from, they read an article somewhere, they, they, they browse through lists, they look at your famous carousels and stuff like that. And in the end, they all end on the product detail page. And, and that's where they actually make their product decision, their buying decision. Um, that, that's, I mean, all the other stuff that we are seeing here uh, in, the, in the buy phase, uh, he aborts a product uh, a buying decision that he already done. So that's something they that should avoid. Uh, the first is moving him to an idea of buying things, but in the end on the product detail page, that's where he ends up buying it. So, and one of the big things there uh, is content. Um, uh, we always say, make the content resonate with what your uh, user or visitor actually has as a kind of a motivation. So is he someone who's actually looking at buying things already? Or is he one that's actually comparing products? And uh, for these two types, product pages and product information should widely differ. Um, uh, if it's uh, uh, in, in the buying uh, motivation already, why should he actually give you, why should you uh, present him with 500 different options and you're just sending him back to a comparing mode or stuff like that. And if he's like in, in researching what is there, you need inspirational information as well in comparison. So um, an excellent content would resonate with all those personas, maybe in different variations. Uh, but to go there, um, there's a lot of housekeeping that you have to do. Um, and product information is something that is not only content, but also a data and, and structuring. It's also a thing that needs processes to get uh, uh, done. Um, yeah, and that's over to Ben Wundt. Uh, ben Wundt, actually, sorry. Uh, too much English in the head. Um, uh, yeah. 
there is one question in the chat, Robert, um, about the last slide. People couldn't read the small text. Maybe you can show that again and say some oh. words about that. Okay, I'll do. Thank you. I think I can stop. Yeah. So this there's there's four basic um motivations that a, that a user could have in your uh if he's visiting you so if he's inspirational he's probably a first time visitor to your shop or at least in this kind of a session he's browsing looking for choices as kind of an inspiration um you could maybe bring him to impulse buying especially things like hey if you buy this you have your content christmas problem solved um that that's one type of motivations that we see with users the other one is the buyer. He actually just goes to your site because he wants to buy now. So he probably has a link somewhere that it, it's a deep link or a bookmark somewhere. So um, he probably was a researcher or comparer type previously um, and needs high, high usability. He just wants to buy and not being obstructed by stuff like that. Maybe easy payment or something to convince him to buy now. Um, then we have the researcher uh, motivational type um, that has a vague understanding what they need um and they need information if they get the information on your site you will prefer the first one to provide them with as, as much information about that product category as possible uh and you also will look at all your explanatory content or maybe even videos or stuff like that that are not only product related but but give a, a the whole uh, the whole topic an idea and we have the comparers um they know what they want uh they don't need any more consulting or stuff like that. They probably look mostly at price or factors like, can I give it back if it doesn't work or, or availability of the product. Uh, that, that's the, the four motivational types. Important about this is um, it's not like per the classic personas that most people talk about when they uh, think about product pers uh, uh, user personas, but it's more like a, a journey. People can be a different type uh, uh, in, a, in, in a buying journey. They, they probably were one of those four at, at one point in time. Um, so it, it switches between those. OK, so up to Ben Rudd. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. Thank you so much for, for having me. Let me also quickly activate the screen share. So full screen mode should work now. Yep. All good, Robert? All right. So, um, yeah, it's actually a big pleasure. Uh, I don't want to say many, many more words about myself. They can, people can look me up on LinkedIn, uh, who I am and what I've done. Uh, for sure, I have lost my heart to the passion of turning data into business outcomes for different businesses. And uh, so today, actually, we really wanted to look at one of the trends uh, within hyper automation, which uh, many companies, including Gardner, are talking about, um, but how to make it work in e commerce and actually how we're getting there. So let's take a look uh, with all this super fancy AI and machine learning. The good news for you is it will just make the world a better place. You can take your hands off your computer, you don't have to do anything more. You will sell successfully in e-commerce like hell. The world is just better now. How does that sound for you as e-commerce uh, people? Yeah, I think it, it sounds like a real big promise. Pick up the phone, pick up the phone. Your dreams are calling you. So when you look at your business targets, your objectives you have in your role, as an e-commerce uh, manager, what are the key KPIs which matter for you? I think the conversion rate is probably always one of the top three KPIs. It always was and, and it still is. And of course, if machine learning would take that to a next level, that would be fantastic. And by the way, right, you're also seeing our Twitter hashtags, myself of Riversend, of Robert and of AX, so feel free to follow us or engage with us. You can do that live or, or after that. Um, and uh, I was just thinking of we guys that talked about singing and karaoke at the beginning and the warm up. And uh, I think I should probably sing about my favorite single Elvis Presley. 
Not sure if you want to hear that. So of course, next to the KPIs, the product returns are also a big pain uh, for people doing online business. Uh, you probably know what a return package costs you. What are the handling costs of that? And uh, it would be great to impact that, right? Reusing the returns uh, and optimizing uh, the, the margins and the operational costs with it. Sadly, I think it's always not that easy how the new world promises it. Uh, there's a few things we have to look at. And I looked up in many, many presentations uh, I did over years uh, in the e-commerce space and found a pretty old school example. You can also see that uh, by the style of it and, and, and the pixels here, but I picked that for today. Some of you who have maybe been to Florida for a vacation trip have seen the lovely manatees. But this example, once uh, sold online uh, by a US company, has actually created a shitstorm on social media. Why? If you look actually at two dresses which have been sold, which is a women's dress, normal size, looked great. It was clarified with the attribute and colors dark heather gray. But the plus size, you have already spotted it was promoted as manatee gray. I think there's no other comment. And there are so many stories of failures and problems uh, in, in e-commerce categorization of content. Um, and I don't have to give you all of them, but uh, this is a one I really uh, always enjoyed. So you guys also know what uh, AX Semantics is doing. And of course, with the growing volumes in e-commerce, uh, growing internationalizations, larger assortments, it is about compelling and convincing content that drives conversions. And uh, when we're talking about hyper automation, we're also talking about how can you achieve compelling and high volume and maybe changing content in e-commerce, which is automated by machine learning and the offerings like AX, for example, is doing it. Pro there is sadly one problem with that. For example, imagine you have just a few basic information about a product you're selling. Uh, I've taken the example of a phone and uh, looking at a few attributes like the RAM, product name, resolution, display sizes, product type or storage information. If you just have such little information, you can use AX uh, logics to automate a description. You can probably read through it, see the headline, which you would look on the e-commerce page, um, the smartphone a description, which says unlimited photo storage. Um, but I think I'll let you judge if you think this is convincing content for you to take a buying decision. You probably know the answer. When you look into your own organization, Maybe you want to take a minute to think through who is involved in your organization, who is touching the products you're selling online from either sourcing them, creating them, enriching them. Um, and these examples here are just um, high level categories of procurement or supply chain of product management, marketing, maybe some IT people, e-commerce people and so on. And uh, that is a very simplified view because if we look into that with a bit more depth, we actually see um, a more granular example. Let's take a look at that one I've uh, pulled out for you. I've taken a soap product, which, wow, this is a very busy slide, but that is reality. Uh, worked with a customer who is selling and producing actually manufacturing soaps. So there is a global name of a product. Um, some base formulation and a formula code and probably the scent color of the soap, right? Not all soap is transparent white, right? There might be different colors of it. If you go a level deeper, you, there is already an item code, including the, the pack capacity and the volume, uh, and the weight and the, and, and the fitting volume of such a soap. If you look further before selling it, you need a label. Then you look into probably consumer packs, let's say a pack of two, which uh, may also have a certain cheating, uh, a global 
uh, identification number. Um, or there is bigger packages, let's say a, a package of, of five uh, soaps. There's, you're displaying it probably in a store on a display or a certain box. And that box obviously at the end lets, uh, lands on a pallet to, to get shipped somewhere. And uh, I've taken the time to color parts of that many descriptions where they're actually coming from. Um, and the departments in that case have been supply services, marketing, we see that at the bottom here, R&D, regulations for, from legal compliance issues, marketing, finance, and sales. And that already describes that this can become a pretty complex thing to manage, especially when the volumes are growing or when the products are more depending on relationships uh, or technical depth. Um, I would say automotive car parts are even more complex than, than the soap. And so on. So, but you know what matters in your business the best. I don't have to tell you that. I took the freedom to take another uh, example because when you look at a lid of a coffee cup, and I think you all have been to a Starbucks uh, or somewhere where you're taking your coffee to go. So, imagine you have plastic lids, and uh, with that comes certain detailed attributes um, from an ID to descriptions, types, sizes, colors, materials, uh, manufacturing units, and so on. And you have to get control of that. So you can manage certain content by automation using business rules to create descriptions or mapping it to a product type, uh, mapping it to material, or ma mapping it to uh, packaging quantities, and so on. But you sometimes have multi-values, let's say like sizes or, or usage of it, right? This cup can be used for coffee or tea and other things. Uh, or you need a certain context of usage because it's only belonging to a certain organization uh, or business unit, or you have a manufacturing unit or a country you're only selling that to. That is a, uh, what, what I would call context. Um, but going further, you have to create very often relationships. You have parent-child relationships, you have it in different sizes, you have it in different colors, you have replacements, or up or cross sell things. You have the information of what is compatible with whom and what uh, or cross sell items. Uh, and that is just an example, which I think everyone knows and understands from daily life. And I think these things happen in every business. You have to manage sometimes bill of materials, groups or lists. You try to sell a kit, a bundle or full collection. Um, and I use the, the, the cup in this example, not to use the typical fashion story, right? Of selling a look or a lookbook and so on. I think that is already pretty, pretty known to mo most people. There is a kind of situation like this in, in all companies. And when I said I, I'm a big believer in driving value from data, I think I have somehow to mention that uh, I was once part of issuing like, actually research to prove the better data quality for e-commerce KPIs. Uh, and companies using PIM solutions, for example, have been proving that their conversion rates went up 35%, the margins increased 44%, and the time to market in average was 75% faster um, with using PIM solutions to enable e-commerce. And that is a separate topic itself. Um, I'm happy to have a conversation on that. There's a lot of publications and also a blog I can offer for people who want to go deeper on the ROI topic. But at the end, right, it is about right, making, making really true benefits for clients. Um, I think I can't ignore the fashion uh, industry completely, which uh, people who know me, I know I'm a bit addicted to that, is I was working uh, with a customer who was having the problem of manual efforts and slow time to market because they had high volumes with all the seasonal changes. Right? Today in fashion, every week, is a kind of a new season. Uh, it was different in, in the older world. Um, what we help them solving is really reducing the product introduction timeline massively, actually by 80%, and help them grow their product assortment from one to more than 2 million. And obviously that has a big impact uh, on their revenues. So when I look back uh, to what you, Robert, said earlier, everyone's talking about the personalization, right? Uh, the relevant offering to the right person at the right time, at the right uh, moment, that requires to connect the dots between products, locations, customers, so the customer, so the prospect, 
from where am I shipping, uh, for example. IKEA is doing a lot of fulfillment from their stores. So their stores play a role in their fulfillment strategy for e-commerce deliveries and so on. The product thing we have already talked, uh, I think, in, in depth. So what is now happening uh, and what are some of the trends and how, how uh, data is enabling this automation uh, topic? So let's uh, look a bit beyond that. Um, I think what we're seeing now, which is now coming to play, is the reuse of customer reviews. That is not super fancy, uh, but you have to do it. You have to collect it. You have to relate it back to your products. And you have to reuse it, whether in just the online channel or in any other of the um, omni-channel strategy you're, you're pursuing for your customer experience. I think the next level of content automation is not only looking at the ratings, actually looking at the reviews, the review titles. Um, I put two examples here where a review says, don't put it in the washing machine. Or the other one says down there, it's warm, but not waterproof. So the question for a company, either who's producing it or just reselling it, is how can I take this data and run semantic analysis to produce and a kind of ongoing cycle, better attributes, better descriptions, which make it clear to the customers what they will get. And that finally turns the cycle back to the outcomes on it will not be returned or you will not receive a negative rating. The customer keeps the product, the customer knows what to expect and actually gets that. Uh, same is if you're ordering something and you would know that this shirt looks transparent and I don't like that, I would probably not order it. I think it's a very simple thing. But this is kind of how you can analyze customer feedbacks and turn that into better data to level up your experiences and, des and descriptions, for example. By the way, um, as we promised uh, to look at uh, automation and personalization e-commerce, I put for you not to read it now, but as a follow-up, a checklist of 15 smart uh, ideas for better e-commerce personalization. Um, you may judge that by yourself. Have you already done that or not? But I think the next big thing what we will be seeing is truly show personalized descriptions per user. I have not seen that uh, yet really in the mass market, but that's one of the next big things which is coming. That's why I added a number 16 to that because this is what I'm seeing on the horizon coming. Um, other things which use machine learning or algorithms to personalize recommendations is, for example, a story which I recorded in the interview on Data Talks recently uh, with the founder of uh, Vinobox, which is a, a Dutch-based uh, online wine retail. And what they do is they analyze the wines you like and the feedback you give. They use all the attribute details and kind of from taste and grapes and smells and all the things which make a good wine. And they map that to potential other wine recommendations which might be a good fit to you. And they not only say you like Sauvignon Blanc, I offer you other Sauvignon Blanc, right? Uh, Robert, you had this washing machine example earlier, right? Or what you have just bought. They take kind of ingredients, tastes or other smells and more details from wine and see in what other wines are already existing. You probably would have not ex uh, kind of expected that this wine could be good for you because you're always narrowed down to that. And I can say that by my own experience, the people know me, you have seen me on presentations. I had this wine shopping story, which I'm always using and I'm not doing that today, I'll promise, is I have my preference and I only buy my preference uh, because I know what I'm getting. Um, but with this, I'm being exposed to potential wines I would have never expected. And that's new revenue potential for everyone. Um, really smart uh, ideas. But at the end, you need to have the data to enable that. And that's what we're doing uh, in, in, many, in many companies. We help them planning uh, what they want to do and where they want to sell, source the, the data for it, connect it, enrich it, and, and bring it out uh, faster in the market. But I think it's important that we look at another checklist to get the data right. And I, I called it the path to great data. And there's a few categories. I want to give you examples what you should consider in order to enable these automations and, and personalizations and uh, digital um, experiences. 
First is completeness. Uh, completeness means what data is missing or is unusable. And an example of that is you get a product from a supplier, what is probably missing? Price, uh, very simple, um, or color, size, and so on. The next one is conformity. What data, in what format is it stored or not stored, right? When you're getting data from other systems or sources, in what format are you getting them, right? And there's the usual standards, there's JSON files, there's all the Excel, CSV files, there's XML and so on, but you have probably a certain standard. The sources have to fulfill it. Um, what are you doing if all different types of coming? So you have to get control of that and you have to map them and, and, uh, and connect them. Then look at the, uh, looking at consistency. Um, well, what data values gives you conflicting information? And the conflict could be you get two times the same product from two different suppliers. So how you're identifying, matching, and merging that, and what actually, who, which source, or which person actually provides the better quality of that, which is a quality store score you can trust when the data comes again, or there's updates coming. That is an important thing which needs to be solved. Then let's look at the accuracy. What is data which is incorrect or probably out of date? Examples for that are, yeah, is it, is it valid for the season? Or is the, war the warranty valid? There could be many things what means being correct or in time or out of date in your business, in your industry. I think then a very common thing um, is duplication or deduplication. What records um, or attributes are repeated? For example, a duplicate customer or the identification of customer. People know me as Ben, but my, uh, I'm born as Benjamin. So is Benjamin and Ben Rund the same person? Very simple things which have to be fig figured out by either a clear one-to-one -one matching or a probabilistic fuzzy matching uh, logic where you take together different logics uh, and criteria to, uh, to identify, is that a match? Um, does it have a certain level of completion by different attributes of let's say 97% or more? Um, or is it is the, the matching score below 75? So you better want a person to look at it before you let your system automatically match and merge things. And the same like uh, for items or suppliers or what have you. And finally, the integrity. Is there something missing? Um, and I think it could be, let's say, an energy class certification or food and nutrition uh, facts and so on. Um, and there might be other examples in different industries. So I think the big potential now of controlling the quality of the data, which sometimes does not sound very sexy to people, and it sometimes could be a hard thing to do, but the impact could be huge. The impact could be huge, for example, using machine learning, making you as a company for your customers move from selling attributes and features to selling a value, which is an advantage for your clients. Um, yeah, when I look outside the window, I see actually it's snowing today. Uh, so I should probably invite people for a winter barbecue, uh, only one household in, in my, my region, for example. But what does it mean, right? I would buy a new barbecue grill, so I would may understand, okay, this is the size. I look for a grill maybe online. I say, this is the size and many attributes to it. But what really matters to me is how much does actually fill and fit on that grill. Because this is my family. I have three people in my family. We eat fish, we eat whatever kind of uh, meat stuff. So I think the important question is how many things what you like to eat fit on that, that grill so that it meets your, your, your usually uh, group of friends you're inviting or your family parties or whatever you're doing. I think this is kind of value selling and not attribute selling, but the data can be the foundation of that. And if we look at actually a, I think a more compelling uh, product description could be like this. You remember the thing what we looked at at the beginning, uh, the very brief list of product attributes and a very comprehensive list, which you can only get when you really do any of the things while we looked at that in the last couple of uh, minutes in that conversation. Uh, 
the outcome on the right hand side is really a much more richer detailed and value oriented description. And I think the AX team actually has many, many of these examples. I only took two to uh, right, prove what actually is the before and after when you really take the data serious. So I think my view clearly is, uh, and I'm glad to be part of that market. Yeah, imagine you're going not on a hunt, but watching, uh, watching uh, a safari and, and trying to, to find where the lion sleeps tonight is what can you automate if you don't get your data right or you're looking in the right direction? Maybe think about that. And uh, when you're looking into how should your experience look for the customers tomorrow, the next one, two years, the next decade, what is the prerequisites you need starting doing today in order to achieve this wonderful, fantastic experience everyone is putting on their agenda. Yes, thank you, Ben. Uh, well, clapping, but feels lonely with only one person, but that's how it is. Thank you very thank you. much. Uh, I love the examples. I love the barbecue girl uh, example because it's, it's uh, really that shows the transformation from you have the data, everyone has the data over how big the stuff is, but you don't use it for anything in the value argumentation of the product and you're not putting it into kind of an explanatory stuff. So yeah, thank you. Um, any questions from the audience? So we have some good feedback. Thank you, Tessa. Uh, it's good feedback is good, is good as well. Uh, if you have otherwise, you can always just drop Lisa or something in email from one of the hundreds of emails we send out for the uh, meetups. And I think, Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong, we normally send out some short recordings or, or slides or something a day after or something as soon as you get around, correct? Yes, correct. Yeah, because that's normally the first question that pops up. Uh, <laughs> do, do we get the slides or not? But, yeah, and that's a question which can be answered the easiest way. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so thank you, Ben. Otherwise. Ah, we have one question in the question and answers. Oh. Yeah. Do you only optimize using the client product data? Do you take other inputs as search keywords? Okay, that's probably a question for AX or me. So yes, you can do take other inputs, uh, search keywords or something is something that's totally possible. Um, so that's something that, that people do or uh, we have on uh, some of our customers, especially in the category text areas are using external sources like uh, search metrics. Um, giving them a, a um, kind of a graph, how they should do your um, link building and stuff like that. So you can mix data. Uh, also, um, Ben, can you go back to the, the slide with the 15 crazy stuff you can do with product data? Yeah, the, hold on. the first you one. Be, you yeah. Be <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Thank you. There is the first one is deliver weather sensitive personalization. So you can actually mix weather in it as well. So um, uh, a good example for that is if you have a hardware store, which is selling barbecues, um, you're selling barbecues, but if it's bad weather, um, you might want to sell the barbecue cover of it as well, because people would like to have that as well. So that's something if you think about the, um, the Moby Grum and customer journey stuff that I, that I showed in my slides, um, that's actually something to trigger a purchase after the original one. So if you have someone who bought a barbecue last week and he's now, it's now Friday Friday morning and you know it's gonna rain today or on the, on the uh, um, uh, weekend, uh, you can actually put that information into a newsletter and uh, take, hey, you bought a grill, maybe you want that matching cover um, uh, and buy it. So Phil, I hope that answered your question. If not, feel free to open another one. Um, and we have, what is the scope for automation for sourcing public data, which could even be on the competitor side to improve your own product descriptions? So that's probably something for Ben uh, as well. Uh, you know, I'm definitely happy to talk on that. And uh, of course, I think there's, there's, there's many, many techniques of doing that. Um, for example, right, the typical scraping uh, of the web 
And then, of course, uh, there comes always a question of the IP on the one hand side, but there's, I think there's good services who scrape the internet and help you, first of all, create an analysis. And typical use cases, I think what I've seen is you, first of all, you monitor your competition to compare what is the depth or width of their portfolio in a certain category. They just offer more or they offer brands what you don't have. Uh, that's what retailers, for example, do. Then um, I've seen that, let's say, brand manufacturers who have also a binding price agreement with the resellers, they monitor if they're really sticking to the price, uh, which is agreed uh, in, in the resale contracts and so on. So I think overall, I would actually say, um, and had a good conversation uh, with uh, a person of uh, University uh, St. Gallen CDQ recently, which says the uh, data sharing is actually taking data to a new level. Where on the one hand side, um, of course, the big discussion is people who think their product content is unique to their e-commerce success. They don't want to share that and don't want others to reuse that and would make go, uh, go legally against it. But if we look at, let's say, common data, let's say in B2B address space, for example, where when you would actually would share that data with others, you, everyone would actually profit from it because it's, uh, it's public knowledge. Uh, you just have to use it right. Um, but I think it depends also on the strategy, uh, how you want to go about it regarding how you use the competitive information. Yeah. What can you steal? What is IP, which is a critical thing? Uh, or what is thing which you can use to other react on it as a competitive analysis? Uh, that's, I think, uh, the smartest way uh, what I'm seeing these days. Yeah. What, what I've also seen is uh, people putting information like competitor availability of products into their own product content. So for example, this is a rare item and we are happy to have 10 items of that left in the store. Um, if you, if you think about the customer motivational typologies that I showed, uh, that would especially trigger the uh, inspirational or buyer persona to buy now because they would be afraid of finding it somewhere else or not finding it somewhere else. And we have another question from uh, Leonie Klinghammer. Uh, what do you use to extra extrapolate information from customer ratings? Like how do you automate that? I think that's for Ben as well because you showed the example. Yeah, well, I think I think that's a que question for for us together, right? Mm -hmm. If we um, if we go back to uh, what we looked at earlier, right, uh, the custom rating topic, and on one inside the the, the the simple ratings um, is uh, it's a pretty straightforward thing, right? Uh, you collect them either in real time, which is sometimes actually not important so much. Uh, I would say uh, in a certain cadence, you store them, you connect them to a certain product. Um, and you republish them uh, when you when you want to promote that this is a super right uh, you know, five star hundred percent rating or, or what have you. Uh, um, then of course the question is, what are you doing with the, the personal data of the customer? Right, of course if this is a permission topic that is being usually uh, then uh, tracked if you allow and you ask uh, in your policies uh, and you ask the users to check that they're okay of reusing and even maybe reusing the name you're putting. If you do decide as a user, if you want to publish your name um, and you give the rights to re reuse it, that's the one aspect of it. And then when you look into the semantic analysis, that's, uh, that's I think the, the really the next level discipline where are you using semantic machine learning techniques to identify certain categories, right? This is the a positive uh, or is it a negative or is it towards certain categories or attributes and then the question always is how do you pull that back to display what is the kind of the content uh, or the, the marks you're reading from it sometimes it could be hard it could be nonsense and there's nothing you're taking out from it but if you see that there is a repeated thing right a repeated pattern where it's not only one user saying something because it could be one of a million and it's probably not relevant because it's just a frustrated person and you don't care about it. But if you see and you define from what volume you see, it's, you think it's a relevant feedback, it's a helpful feedback, you still combine, you analyze 
things, you map them into categories. Because if you have a, have a lot of things around waterproof or transparent outfit or whatever, and you, you identify patterns, then you can display that into categories and you still let a product manager or a category manager decide whether this is a helpful thing. And um, you can use then the AX logic to make a proposal out of the text, how that could sound. Uh, and then you decide if you make that part of your standard descriptions or not just to, or you decide from a governance process that you probably need to add a new attribute to your product, which did not ex exist before. But that uh, is not a thing which happens as a one-off. That then goes into this, uh, maybe the circles, what you have internally of um, creating and approving products before they become a standard, which are being sold. Um, and happy to have a separate conversation uh, in more depth on that as a follow-up. Yeah, I want to add two cents from that on my side. When we've seen with some of our more successful customers, um, one of those with like more than 100,000 products, what they actually did, they didn't use like big machine learning or, or semantic analysis there. They got most value out of it by just looking at all the feedback that they got, product reviews, and also uh, call center questions. So they made the call center uh, note down all product questions like is this it's a fashion thing so is, is it machine washable or can I uh, can I do I have to open up the buttons or do I have to wash it inverse out or something and uh, put that information back into a loop then into the product information management system and from there into the product content that's been written with AX um, and just by making all the people in the in this chain aware of that information, they reduced support hotline calls, um, saving them a seven-digit amount of euros each year. Um, we don't know how how much exactly they don't tell that, but it's something with more than a one in the first digit. Um, so it's a significant thing that that has impact on on totally different uh, parts of the organization because it actually saves call center money, which is not the people that in the e-commerce store are actually mainly responsible for. Okay, we have another question to uh, about uh, um, will machine will the uh, human product description writers being taken uh, replaced by machines? Um, uh, so Ben. Maybe you want to answer that, or should I? I, I think you should answer it. Okay. Um, I think yeah. we'll, we'll, it will take time that it is fully uh, machine yeah. driven. So um, you probably have a better uh, prognosis uh, when and how that uh, that shift happens. Yeah, I've had, I've had the roadmap. No, actually, um, it's good news is if you're a writer, you'll not be replaced by a machine. Um, so we, we know very well, I mean, you're doing research on that, scientific research and product research and, and classic engineering. So we know that um, if you look at it from a very semantic and, and informational perspective, um, you need all the knowledge of the world to derive how many hot dogs and steaks you could put on a barbecue if you just have the same size information. Because if you look at that, you might want to find out how many steaks or hot dogs put on a certain grill, that's fine. But different countries have different kinds of meat that they want to grill. So it, it, uh, it's, if you look at it from a copywriting perspective to really resonate with the, with the reader, you have to actually be in his domain and that creativity is a thing that humans have. That's not something that a machine can take care of. So we think uh, at least for the next few years, um, the, the human creativity will be augmented by the AI or writing AI. Uh, and um, we have tools that help you with writing, but the, and it help you with all the technical aspects. Um, and we've probably seen some of the right first uh, 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 product um, updates that we had in the last few weeks and months that, that focus on helping you going back to a writer and not like a technology manipulator. Um, but in the end, it's the human creativity that is being left, but only that. Um, so you don't have to do repetitive content editing. Think about the uh, hand, shoes, the hand shoes thing. So if you now know waterproof is an information that you have to put in your product descriptions, you have to go all the product description for all your hand shoes and maybe other items as well and go back and then edit like hundreds of stuff and all add and it's not waterproof or please don't put it in a washing machine because it is not waterproof. So, and that's not something that you want to do 
because that's not a really worthwhile stuff. That's something that machines can do. Um, so keep the copywriting to uh, a writer's thing and the copywriting a competency. I think that is that is a good point. And uh, I guess we have also the, this uh, additional question or feedback from Tessa. Oh yeah. Uh, I'm currently trying to integrate customer reviews from trusted shops. However, at the moment, only one API so the info would be processed automatically. Maybe it would be consideration in the future to have several API interfaces per project to get data for text from more sources of discipline. That's a super good question. And I'll, I'll invite you to our next week's meetup <laughs> where we'll talk about, uh, it's really random. Thank you, Tessa, for that question. That's the best. Um, we, um, you know, can I add something oh, to that, Robert? Oh, you then, yeah. Yeah, um, I think for sure, I think um, the number of sources of collecting information, of course, is growing and that's never, that's not, that's not ending. Uh, I think the opposite is happening. Um, I think you should definitely use more sources. The question, but then is, how do you still make sure that this rating is connected to the right product? That comes then, that only, in my opinion, should happen in a muscle data experience platform uh, or a PIM platform, because this is where you can connect it. Um, you don't have to also store, but you at least can relate it through using different APIs, bringing it back at one sing single point. Otherwise, you cannot make take the full advantage of reusing all that. But definitely, you should probably use more sources of collecting, not just from the PIM, but Let's just say when I look at customer data, for example, I think I've seen projects where companies have stored customer data in 150 different applications globally. And how do you then know if you, well, that was in a hotel business, for example, if you go to the same hotel in Stuttgart versus Miami, how do you know that, do they know it's you um, and it's, it's you with your profile? because you have your email systems, you have your social media, you have your customer uh, service uh, touch points and so on um, to consolidate that back. So all these interactions, whether it's ratings um, or customer reviews and whatever, or, or profile data, you have many, many points where you're gathering uh, them. You can use APIs from, from everywhere. But of course, if you want to reuse them in an efficient way for better experiences, you have to bring them somewhere together in order to reuse them for your advantage. And I think that is my answer to, to your, your question. Uh, if there is a reason why it's called master data management. Uh, and if you think about the, I did that in the intro of the value chain, we are very far back in the, in the, in the value chain of content. Um, so um, especially Tessa, for the problem that you have, you probably need to integrate earlier in the value chain, put it into the master data as some kind of master data information that it will automatically flow into AX as well. Um, yeah. yeah good, good conversation, yeah. Okay. On the, okay. I think you can connect via the FCKEU with the same product number in the, ah, okay, and you're interested in best practice experience. Yeah, well, a best practice, I think it would be matching it into a PIM. I can, you tell stories about the unique product number that some of our customers think are unique, which are not. Um, so then. Yeah, then I think uh, we, we touched upon that topic uh, with a few other examples earlier, uh, right? Uh, you think uh, a simple, um, SKU ID or let's say a cheating uh, is an easy thing to match, right? Then you know this is exactly the same product. Um, if you don't have that, you may consider definitely a probabilistic and fuzzy uh, match and merge logic with it, where you use a collection of attributes uh, and uh, based on how many of them are a match, you then either let's say with 97% of them are a match, you put it together and you match and merge it together into one record. Um, if you, and you define these credit, these, let's say these quality gates, uh, you decide uh, on them. And if it's below a certain other score, you just display it and you still have a, a business person look at it and, and decide, is it truly the same thing? And then you, uh, but you automate still then the matching and merging of the attribute values then together 
um, or overrides the, the ones which are claimed as a trusted source. And that happens also over time. Machine learning helps with that because it learns it over time and it matches the, let's say, the right attribute size of the grill or whatever uh, the next time when it comes again. So that learns by the time. But to, uh, still, you have to just, uh, set up the governance rules and processes to, to enable that. Um, and then, right, some things will be automated over time and machine learning will help on it. And some things will always be put in, in the display for the business user. Please review that. Please take a decision uh, if it's a correct uh, match or you put it back to the people who are creating it uh, or providing the data. Okay, you're very welcome, Tessa. Um, so I think that was good. Thanks for all the questions. Uh, going down into some of the details, I like that. Um, yeah, and I think that's that's it for today. Thank you very much for all you participants. Thank you, Ben, for joining me here. That's um, I am Yeah, problem. it was a pleasure uh, yeah. being with you guys today, and I look forward to, to uh, maybe a continued conversation. Okay, and we'll stay in contact. In contact. If you have any questions, just answer to one of the emails that we send out, and we can follow up or follow up with, with Ben on Twitter or uh, uh, email or something. Okay, thank you very much. Have a nice day. Have a good one. Thank you.